into some chapter four. So where we're going to start today is on section 4.5 of chapter four. Earlier on, way back in September, we covered section 4.1 through to 4.4. And section 4.5 deals with the subject of oxidation reduction reaction. And sometimes we call these, you know, we have the ox here and we have the reed here. So we call these redox reactions. And oxidation and reduction, if you're wondering what these things mean. Well, first, let's start by talking about oxidation. Oxidation is the loss of electrons. And we like to use this, um, this mnemonic here, which is OIL, which stands for oxidation is losing. So we could put that in here. Oxidation is losing. And what are you losing? You're losing electrons. And reduction is the gain of electrons. And we like to use RIG, so we have oil RIG when we put it all together. And again, RIG stands for, redu sorry, reduction is gaining. And what are you gaining? You're gaining electrons. Well, what about electrons? Remember, electrons are, are negative, okay? Now, I know that probably a lot of you would roll your eyes at that and say, okay, good gravy. I know that by now that electrons are negative, but I want you to Remember that because we're going to be looking at adding some positive and negative numbers today. So if we know that oxidation is losing electrons and reduction is gaining electrons, an oxidizing agent is something that's going to gain electrons and get reduced. Okay. Another way of saying it is that the oxidizing agent is going to, is going to cause the oxidation okay, in something else. Okay. So an oxidizing agent gets reduced and a reducing agent is something that's going to cause reduction and if it causes reduction it's going to get oxidized okay something that i forgot to tell you at the very beginning is this right here oxidation and reduction always occur together you can't have one without the other it's like love and marriage right they have to exist together and Finally, this last point that I want to cover is that the redox reaction involves electron transfer. And I want you to remember that electrons are negative. So again, oil, oxidation is losing electrons, reduction, um, rig, reduction is gaining electrons, an oxidizing agent gets reduced, right? It's an agent, so it causes oxidation and something else. And a reducing agent causes something else to get reduced and gets oxidized in the process. Give me a thumbs up if you follow me just on slide number one. Slide number one. Okay, great. Wonderful. Okay, well, I'm not done with slide one. I have one more point I want to say to you <clears throat> before we move on. I'm not going to write it down. I'm just going to say it out loud to you, but I want you to keep this in your mind, okay? When we dealt with acid-base chemistry, Right? And we looked at acid-base chemistry earlier on in this, in this class. The currency of acid-base chemistry was protons, right? H+. Plus. In redox chemistry, in redox reactions, the currency is electrons. So we're really going to focus on electrons in this section. Here's the redox process occurring in the formation of a compound. What happens if you take magnesium and you combine it with oxygen, right? Here we have a magnesium atom and an oxygen atom, right? These two species right here, let me get the black pen in. These are atoms, nothing more than atoms. A good old atom from the periodic table, right? You have an atom of magnesium, you have an atom of oxygen. Why is the magnesium bigger than the oxygen? Well, remember that the size of an atom decreases as we go from left to right across the periodic table. Also, I'll give you a second reason. Magnesium is in the third period and oxygen is in the second period. So, hey. Everything looks reasonable to me. Now, when we combine magnesium and oxygen, okay, what's going to happen? Well, remember, magnesium is a metal, right? Magnesium is found in group 2A. What do metals like to do? They like to lose electrons, right? Oxidation is losing electrons. So what does that tell you? It tells you that the magnesium is going to get oxidized, right? So as the magnesium goes from here to magnesium 2 plus, it's undergoing oxidation, right? It's losing electrons. How many electrons is it going to lose? Well, when magnesium loses electrons, it is in group 2A, so it likes to lose two electrons because when magnesium, if, and you should have a periodic table with you right now, always have a periodic table in chemistry class. 
When magnesium loses two electrons, it becomes isoelectronic with a noble gas, which is neon. Okay, so that's why it's going to lose those two electrons, but we can't create and we can't destroy matter. So where the heck do those two electrons go? Well, I want you to look at where oxygen is found on the periodic table. You can see that oxygen is element number eight, has eight electrons. But if it gains two electrons, it can become isoelectronic with neon as well. And so oxygen will want to gain two electrons. Reduction is gaining. So that means that oxygen is being reduced as it goes from oxygen to oxide, O2 minus. Okay. Now there's a lot of things to say about this slide. I just want to think about a couple more concepts. Let's think about the sides as we go from the magnesium atom to the magnesium ion. Why is it decreasing? Why did they dry this little tiny magnesium 2 plus? Does this make sense? The answer is yes, of course it does. Okay, it's not a typo. And the reason why that makes sense is because did the number of protons in the magnesium atom change when we went from magnesium zero or magnesium that's neutral to magnesium two plus? The answer is no, right? The number of protons, as I told you from the very beginning of the class, governs the identity of the atom. So it's still a magnesium atom. Now it's a magnesium ion. It's got the same number of protons, but it's got less electrons. And so those electrons that are remaining are going to feel more of the effective nuclear charge. They're going to feel more of that positive charge from the nucleus, and they're going to be pulled in even tighter. So, of course, as magnesium gets oxidized to magnesium 2 plus, it decreases in size. What about when the oxygen goes from oxygen to oxide? You can see that it's increasing in size. It's not a big increase, but you can tell that this sphere is a little bit bigger than this one. Does that make sense? Yes, of course it does. Right, we're, we still have the same number of protons when we go from oxygen to oxide, but we're gaining electrons. So that means that each one of those electrons are going to feel less of that effective nuclear charge. The number of protons in that positively charged nucleus did not change, but now we have less protons per number of electrons. Therefore, they're not going to be pulled in as tight, and so it's going to get a little bit bigger. Another, and if you're wondering, hey, Mr. Dion, what about electron-electron repulsion? Now I've got more negative charges. Aren't they just going to repel and need more space? Absolutely. Absolutely. And so now we've got two beautiful explanations, okay, to uh, rationalize as, well, as to why oxygen goes when it gets um, reduced to oxide as to why it increases in size. Now you can see that since the magnesium has a 2 plus charge and the oxygen has a 2 minus charge, they're going to combine in a one-to-one -one ratio, right? Because our ionic compound, magnesium oxide, the charges are going to completely balance out to make NGL, magnesium oxide. And you see how in this crystal lattice, you can see how those magnesium ions fit in there perfectly. They nestle in with those um, magnesium ions. So that's the redox process in the formation of an ionic compound. Now that's just part A. You're like, oh, Mr. Dion, that was a lot of rambling on for talking about an ionic compound, maybe so, but it's important. Now, what about redox occurring in the formation of, um, of a covalent compound? Well, if we look at hydrogen and chlorine, right? H2, which is a gas, okay? H2, which is a gas, and Cl2, which is a gas. Remember that when you form a covalent compound that you have a sharing of electrons. It's not a transfer of electrons, okay, in the way that it is in an ionic compound. It's not a complete transfer of electrons. But is there some transfer of electrons? The answer is yes, absolutely there is, okay? And if you're wondering, well, how, how would that be if I'm not going to have, you know, ions form the covalent compound, right? But remember, we talked about things like dipoles, and we talked about electronegativity, and we talked about a polar bond. So if I make a bond between a hydrogen atom and a chlorine atom, chlorine is more electronegative than hydrogen. Hydrogen has an electronegativity of around 2.1, and nitrogen has an electronegativity of around 3. Okay, That's a difference of 0.9. And so although the electrons are going to be shared, what does it say here? The key word is that the electrons are distributed unevenly, right? It's an unequal sharing. And so the dipole is going to be going in this direction. You can represent it with an arrow like that, with a cross on the end, or you can use these delta minus and delta plus. And so again, who's being oxidized and who's being reduced? Well, 
overall in terms of redox chemistry here, since the chlorine is taking on more electron density, it's being reduced, right? It's got the delta minus charge. And since the hydrogen is rendered electron deficient, it's got that delta plus, it's being oxidized, okay? We're not, it's, you know, maybe not counting electrons in the exact same way that we did in the ionic, comp in the ionic compound, but based off of our knowledge of electronegativities and polarity, we can see that in whether we're forming an ionic or a covalent compound that we're getting um, oxidation and reduction. Now, I think a wise question, not an intuitive question, but maybe a really wise question to ask about these redox processes would be, how do we keep track of the electrons, you know, in, in, in these um, redox processes, right? It, it's a little easier with the ionic compound than it is with the covalent compounds, right? And what we're going to do is we're going to look at some rules now for assigning what's called an oxidation number for an element or an ion. And an oxidation number is going to be a way for us to keep track of the flow of electrons in a reaction. And based off of our knowledge of oxidation is losing electrons and reduction is gaining electrons, we're going to be able to tell who's being oxidized, who's being reduced, what's the reducing agent, right? What's the oxidizing agent? So let me show you what the rules are for assigning oxidation number, okay? And if you're looking at this table and already thinking, you know, first, if your first question is, are you gonna give me this on an exam? The answer is no, okay? You will never be given this table on an exam. Now you might be intimidated and say, oh no, I'm never gonna get this done. Not true, because you're gonna see that a lot of these rules are kind of blanket rules that cover a lot of different atoms. And so it will become, quite intuitive after you practice a little bit. So let's start by looking at the rules. It says that for an atom in its elemental form, that means in its naturally occurring state, its oxidation number is zero. So if you have some sodium Na, just some sodium metal, we've looked at a picture of sodium metal in this class before, it doesn't have any charge, right? If I touch a piece of sodium, I don't, I don't get a shock from it or anything, right? It's neutral. So it's got an oxidation number of zero. Carbon, oxygen, chlorine, phosphorus, Name an element in the periodic table in its pure form, okay? If you have pure silver, it doesn't have a charge. Silver can have a charge in a compound, yes, in an ionic compound, but pure silver doesn't have a charge. Chlorine, right, Cl2, does it have a charge? Chlorine gas, no. Chloride does, yes, but chlorine does not, okay? So that's the kind of way you want to think about rule one. For a monatomic ion, in a monatomic just means one atom ion, the oxidation number is simply the ion charge. OK, nothing more than that. So if you have, you know, um, and, and, and this is nothing meant to be more anything, nothing more complex than this. If you have, you know, sodium plus, it means it's got an oxidation number of, of plus one. OK, if you have calcium two plus, it's got an oxidation number of plus two. So we could write it down here. Plus one, plus two, plus two. If you had aluminum and it's got a charge of three plus, Hey, what do you know? It's got an oxidation number of plus, plus three. Okay, and if you're thinking like, well, what about nitride? If I had nitride, it's in three minus, it's gonna have an oxidation number of minus three. Okay, nothing more than that. So I think the first two rules are kind of things that you already knew. Okay, nothing really new there for my students. Rule number three says the sum of the oxidation number values for the atoms in a molecule or the formula unit of a compound is gonna equal zero. The sum of the oxidation number values uh, for the atoms in a polyatomic ion is going to equal the ion's charge. What that rule means is this, okay? The first part means if you have a neutral compound, magnesium oxide, right? If you figure out the oxidation number for one of these, since overall magnesium oxide does not have a charge, if you know that this is plus two, well, this has to be minus two because plus two plus minus two is equal to zero. And overall, that, that compound has no charge. Now, if we had something like sulfate, SO4, SO4, 2 minus, like that. We're going to go over the rules for how we assign the oxidation numbers to the sulfurs and to the oxygen. But what the point of rule three is this. Once you've determined the oxidation number of the four oxygens and you tally them up with the oxidation number of the sulfur, it's got to equal minus two. OK, all right. Well, let's again look at the rest of the rules. 
if you have an element in group 1A or 2A, the good news is if it's in 1A, the oxidation number is always plus one. So that's, you know, lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium. If it's in group 2A, um, beryllium, magnesium, calcium, strontium, barium, it's going to be plus two. So, hey, you know, strap your skates on, baby. I mean, that's, that's a wonderful rule, right? If you know the group number, for, if it's in group one or 2A, you are, you're in business, right? Not a whole lot to worry about there. The next one's about hydrogen, right? Which is sometimes found in group A, sometimes it's found in group seven, eight, depending on the situation. But if, if it's hydrogen, if it's in a combination with a non-metal, it's gonna have an oxidation number of plus one. Let me give you an example of that. Uh, where's my pencil? Here it is. An example of that would be, let's say it's in CH4, right? Methane. Carbon is a non-metal. So the oxidation number of hydrogen there would be plus one. The next one says if it's in combination with a metal or boron, like in sodium hydride or uh, boron trihydride or you know calcium hydride or something like that, in that case it's got a charge of minus one. Okay, so that's one you got to memorize. The next one is an easy one. It's the fluorine rule. It's that fluorine is always minus one, no exceptions. Remember the fluorine had a kind of an interesting rule in the in the Lewis structures that fluorine only ever had one bond and three lone pairs. Right, so fluorine is one of those great outliers. And the good thing is that there's no exceptions to it. None, right? Chemistry is replete with exceptions, but there's no exception for that rule. So another wonderful rule. Next one is oxygen. Um, let's start with the second one. The oxidation number for oxygen is usually minus two. Okay? Usually it's minus two. In fact, if you guess that it's minus two, 99% of the time you're going to be right. The only time it's minus one is when it's in a peroxide, like hydrogen peroxide, or if it's um, in combination with fluorine, right? Because there's no exceptions to the fluorine rule, okay? And what else? The last one says if you're in group 7A, so what's group 7A? The halogens, right? So we can put here halogens, halogens. Okay, if you have a halogen, the halogens always have a charge of minus one. Um, when they're in combination with metals or non-metals and other ha halogens lower in the group, okay? Um, so we'll look at that rule as we move through. Um, you know, where it says with in combination with ha other halogens lower in the group, what that means is, let's say you had this compound, iodine trichloride, okay? In this case, it says the oxidation number of the halogens, and there's there, everything in here is a halogen, um, it's going to be minus one in combination with another, and other halogens lower in the group. Since iodine is lower in the group than chlorine, it means the chlorine would be minus one. How many chlorines do I have, right, or chlorides? I have three of those. That's going to be a, give me a charge of minus three. So that would mean that the iodine would have to have a charge of plus three. Okay, that's, that's what this exception means here. And so the oxidation number describes how many electrons the element has compared to its pure form, all right? And we're going to use these to determine when an element is undergoing oxidation or reduction. Give me a thumbs up if you follow me on this slide. A lot of information here, some old, some new. But give me a thumbs up if you just follow me on the concept, of course. And if you're wondering, hey, Mr. Dion, are we going to look at examples of oxidation number? Well, the answer is heck yeah, of course we will. It's a pretty, it's a pretty big subject for me to just, you know, skim over it and say you're on your own. Okay, so let's look at some examples. Okay, and I might refer back to the table a little bit, but you might have to refer to it yourself. Some, these would be perfectly, perfectly legitimate questions uh, for me to ask you on your next exam, not the exam you're going to write, uh, not exam two but your next one, which will be midterm two. And it says here, just determine the oxidation number of each element in these species. The first one is zinc chloride. So let's get started. Where's my pencil? If I have A, which is zinc chloride, ZnCl2. Uh, I just said I wasn't gonna go back a slide, didn't I? Oh, well, I'm on such a fibber. Okay, if we go back to rule 6A, or sorry, rule six, it says that if you um, have a halogen, the oxidation number is going to be minus one when it's in combination with metals. So 
we can rule, use that rule right away. And if you're wondering what rule I mean, I'm using this rule, right? Since the chlorine is combined with zinc and zinc's a metal, that means the chlorine is going to have a charge of minus one. And so the oxidation number of our chlorine is going to be minus one. Now, how many chlorines do we have? We have minus one for the chlorine and there's two of them. So minus one times two gives us minus two. If the overall charge here is zero, I don't see any charge next to zinc chloride. What must the charge on my zinc be? What must the oxidation number of my zinc be? Who could help me out with that? Not a trick question. Yeah, everybody's answering plus two and you're all perfectly correct. So these are the oxidation numbers of the zinc and the chlorine, okay? The oxidation number of the zinc is plus two and the oxidation number of the chlorine is minus one. Nothing more than that. Let me give you a second to think about the next one while I scribble it down. It's sulfur trioxide. Does anybody have an idea about the oxidation number of the oxygen before we, you know, get rocking and rolling here? Does anybody have an idea about the oxidation number of the oxygen in SO3 sulfur trioxide? Again, you'll probably have to look back at the rules. Ashlyn says minus two. Anybody else have an idea? Well, Ashlyn, you're right. Okay. Uh, I wasn't trying to get you to second guess yourself. You're 100% correct. It's minus two. And if you're wondering, how, how did you know that, Mr. Dion? Let's back up. Okay. If we look at oxygen, okay, it says the oxidation uh, number of oxygen is minus one in peroxides. Sulfur trioxide is not a peroxide. Its oxidation number is minus two in all of their compounds unless there's a fluorine, unless it's a com combined with fluorine. And there's no fluorine in sulfur trioxide. So that means the oxidation number of our oxygen is minus two. Okay. Now, how many oxygens do we have? We have a total of three. So if we have minus two times three, that gives us minus six. So if from the oxygen we have a total of minus six and the overall charge of sulfur trioxide which is a gas at room temperature doesn't have a charge okay what must the oxidation number of the sulfur be what must it be it's got to be what yeah gabrielle you're 100 percent correct right Liv? it's exactly it's plus six yeah it's plus six remember this is just a way of keeping track of electrons just a way to keep track of electrons. Who wants to try the last two? Who thinks the last two are worth a worth a shot? Well, I do. So let's let's give them a shot. First one is nitric acid, HNO3. There's a couple of things to, rem to, to remember here. Let's go back and let's talk about hydrogen for a second because there was a rule about hydrogen. It said that hydrogen is going to have a charge of plus one when it's combined with non-metals. Look at the structure of nitric acid or the formula of nitric acid. It's hydrogen in combination with nitrogen and oxygen, which are all non-metals. So that means the oxidation number of the hydrogen is plus one. But hold on a second. Hold the phone. That makes sense because NO3 is nitrate and that has a charge of minus one overall. All right. So it makes sense that the hydrogen would have an oxidation number of plus one. And now let us determine what the oxidation numbers of the oxygen and the nitrogen are. Watch carefully. Overall, the NO3 has to have a charge of minus one, right? It's gonna end up with a negative charge. Oxygen is gonna have a charge of minus two, okay? It's combined with a nitrogen. It's not, it's not a peroxide and it's not combined with fluorine. So the oxygen has an oxidation number of minus two. How many oxygens are there? There's three. So minus two times three gives me negative six. Something, okay, maybe I should put a blank. Something plus negative six has got to equal minus one. What must the answer be? What plus negative six gives me negative one? You could solve this and say x is going to be equal to minus one plus six. What's minus one plus six? It's plus five. Right, so that means the oxidation number of the nitrogen must be plus five. And so now we've determined the oxidation number of the nitrogen as being plus five. The oxygen 
is minus two and the hydrogen is plus one. Let's try one more. Uh, did I give myself more room? Good gravy, no I didn't, okay. All right, let's try and do the dichromate ion. I don't know, I'll use the green pen, I guess, like that. So dichromate is Cr2O7, two minus. What's the oxidation number? I'm just gonna throw this out as a blanket question. What is the oxidation number of the oxygen in dichromate based off of the rules that we looked at on the previous slide? What must it be? Exactly, exactly. Gabriella put that it's minus two. Yeah, Cruz says the same thing as does Aurora. All three of them are 100% correct, right? If, if, if you're not following me, let me back up again. Look, oxygen. Oxygen is going to be minus two unless it's in a peroxide. Dichromate is not a peroxide. And it's, there's no fluorine. So there, there we go. It's got to be minus two. And if you're thinking, man, oxygen seems like it's always minus two. It is most of the time. Most of the time, oxygen is minus two. So the oxygen is minus two. We've got that. How many oxygens are there? There are seven. If you take minus two times seven, what do you get? You get minus 14. Now, overall, the charge of the dichromate is two minus. X plus minus 14 has got to equal minus two. Who could tell me what X must be? It must be plus what? Just a little, you know, algebra. Yeah, X must be positive 12, right? So X must be plus 12. Now, how many chromiums are there? There's two. So we're going to take that and we're going to divide it by two, like that, plus 12 by two. So that means that the chromium is going to have an oxidation state of plus six. So our chromium is plus six and our oxygen is minus two. Okay, give me a thumbs up if you follow me on that. Because if you do, you, my friend, understand oxidation number, at least how to, how to do it, at least how to determine an oxidation number, and you will be in business. Okay, and if you still don't follow me 100% of the way, what would you want to do? You'd want to go to the back of Chapter 4 in our e-textbook, pick some problems that deal with assigning oxidation numbers, and choose the questions that have the little A icon next to them. A stands for answer, and there you go. You would do that. Okay, all right. Well, with that in mind, let's look at a little summary, a short summary of the terminology for oxidation reduction reactions or redox reactions. Remember that when we have reduction, oxidation has to be occurring. Another way of phrasing that would be to say, if there's oxidation, there's gotta be reduction occurring, okay? You cannot have one without the other. So when we talk about that transfer or shift of electrons, if X is losing electrons, then Y has to be gaining electrons. What did we say? We said oil rig, oxidation is losing. So if X is being oxidized, reduction is gaining. Y is being reduced. Now, what I think, and I don't want to confuse anybody, but what I think it's counterintuitive for students once in a while is, um, you know, they'll say, well, if, if, it's, if you're adding something to it, you know, how is it getting reduced? Because reduce sounds like it's lower. But remember, you're adding negative charge, okay? So the oxidation number is going to decrease when something is being reduced, okay? So maybe that's another way of thinking about it. If X is being oxidized and Y is being reduced, it stands to reason that X is the reducing agent, right? Because the reducing agent is what causes the reduction of Y. Why is the oxidizing agent is because it's what it's what causes the oxidation of X. All right, X, when it loses electrons, it's going to increase in oxidation number. So it's going to go from a low number to a high number. And when something gets um, reduced, it's going to decrease its oxidation number. It's going to go from a, <coughs> a high number to a lower number. All right, well, <coughs> the next question deals, or the next slide, not next question, the next slide, and let me just look ahead here, yeah, and the next question, sorry, they deal with what's called a redox titration, 
Now we looked at acid base titrations. In fact, it was the last thing that we looked at in chapter four in um, back in September. So I did cover that content with you. So you are familiar with acid base titrations, but a redox titration works on a similar um, similar concept. And it's showing here the um, reduction titration of oxalate. So C2O4, two minus, that's called the oxalate ion. And um, it's being titrated with the permanganate ion. So MnO4 is the permanganate. And it says here potassium permanganate. Um, potassium permanganate has a deep purple color to it. And then we have the um, sodium oxalate, which is clear and colorless in solution. And then at the end point, the sodium oxalate gets completely titrated by the potassium permanganate. And we end up with um, with uh, this, this light pink color at the end point. Now, if I draw your attention to the equation that's shown here, you'll notice that there's no potassium, right? There's no K in this equation, and there's no Na. There's no sodium. And that's because usually in um, redox titrations, we just write down the net ionic equation for these because the potassium and the sodium are spectator ions. So the K plus and the sodium plus are spec spectator ions. So we leave them out and we just write out that net ionic equation. And if we calculate the or determine the oxidation number of the um, manganese and the carbon in the permanganate ion and the oxalate ion, you can see that manganese has an oxidation number of plus seven and it ends up getting reduced to plus two, right? It ends up undergoing reduction to manganese with a two plus oxidation number. So if the manganese is being reduced, this is being reduced, okay? And you look at the oxidation numbers of the carbon as it goes from being the carbon in oxalate, which has an oxidation number of plus three, to the carbon of carbon dioxide, CO2, which has an oxidation number of plus four. You can see that it's losing electrons, right? Oxidation is losing. And so it's undergoing oxidation. So we have uh, oxidation and reduction. So reduced, so maybe I should just put oxidized just to be consistent here with my wording, oxidized. So what's happening overall here in this redox titration, okay? is that the manganese is being reduced and the carbon is being oxidized. Remember, you can't have oxidation without reduction. Now, in chemistry 1411, which is general chemistry two, and I know many of you are interested in taking that class, you're gonna learn how to balance redox reactions. In chemistry 1401, if I ever ask you anything about a redox titration like this that involves a redox reaction, I will always give you a balanced equation because you look at the stoichiometric coefficients here. I got a, look at this, I got a two and a five and a 16, wow, and 10, eight, you know, so on and so forth. Uh, yeah, you might be wondering, hey, how do I balance that? Well, there's actually a step-by-step -step method for balancing these kinds of reactions, these redox reactions. And um, anyhow, I'm not going to go into the details of that. I could just ramble on about it, but I'll spare you that mumbo jumbo for today and just tell you that if you see a question that deals with a redox um, titration, I'm going to give you the balanced equation. OK, now, if you're wondering, now, what kind of question might you ask? Well, I'm glad you asked. And let's take a look at a question here that deals with that exact reaction that we saw on the previous slide. And you notice that in the balanced equation here, that the spectator ions are even included. Again, you can you can include spectator ions. You can leave them out, you know, whatever you want, okay? Um, the problem is this. You take a solid sample of calcium oxalate. And if you're wondering what the Lewis structure of the oxalate, C2O4, I always have some students who have inquiring minds. So C2O4, two minus, it looks, look, looks like this, where you have two, double bonds to oxygen, and then you have, you know, a negative charge here and a negative charge here. I'm missing some lone pairs, aren't I? Oh, Mr. Deere, I'm putting in lone pairs. Friends don't let friends leave lone pairs, all right? Anyhow, so 
A solid sample of calcium oxalate, which is diluted in some sulfuric acid, requires 2.05 milliliters of 4.88 times 10 to the minus 4 potassium permanganate to reach the endpoint. The balanced equation is shown right here. Calculate the moles of calcium oxalate. Well, I can determine the molar mass of calcium oxalate, can't I, just by going over the periodic table. And I should be able to figure out... Um, Sorry, I don't even need the, the molar mass, do I? Mr. Dion's getting ahead of himself. Okay, I'm getting overexcited here about this question. Look, I mean, let's think about it. What are we given? We're given a beautiful balanced equation. We have all the stoichiometric coefficients. And from our volume and concentration of potassium permanganate, we're going to be able to figure out what? We're going to be able to determine the number of moles of, of KMNO4. And if we know the number of moles of KMNO4, Look at this. We know that for every two moles of potassium permanganate, we consume five moles of calcium oxalate. So there we go. It's, you know, it's not really a long question. It's actually a pretty short question. I was hoping it might be longer, something, you know, really involved. If you're the kind of person that really enjoys the roadmaps that Dr. Silverberg provides in the textbook, she kind of goes over it here with you and she says, what you're going to do is figure out the number of moles of uh, potassium permanganate, and then you're going to get the molar ratio. Where are you going to get that from? Starts with B, ends with balanced equation. That's right, the balanced equation. Okay, so really, you know, this isn't that much new, but it's maybe a little bit of review from our acid base chemistry. In fact, I'm going to solve it on the previous slide so you can look at the balanced equation. Let's think about what are we starting out with? We're starting it with 2.05 mils of potassium permanganate. Can you convert 2.05 milliliters into liters in your head by now. Can anybody do that in their head? How many decimal places, or how many, yeah, how many decimal places would I move the decimal to the, to the left to convert this into liters? Not a trick question. I don't know if my chat isn't working or what. Yeah, Audrey says three, Don says three. Don, you're absolutely correct. No questions asked, right? So look, we're going to move it three places. So we're going to start with 0 0.00205 liters of potassium permanganate. You know what, you guys, just to put this bug in your ear, and this isn't to, to try to intimidate you in any, any way, okay? Mr. Dion doesn't like that kind of way of teaching, okay? trying to be a big meanie or something. But when you take, if, if any of you take chemistry 1411 with me, sometimes we're, we're going to do so much math in that class that oftentimes I will rely on you to do little calculations like that in your noggin, okay, in your brain, okay, just dividing by a thousand, multiplying by ten, things like that. I won't do a conversion factor every time, and you're like, well, you're not doing it here, buddy. True, true, <laughs> okay. We know the concentration of the potassium permanganate, which is 4.88 times 10 to the minus 4 moles of potassium permanganate. It's been a while, hasn't it, since we looked at stoichiometry? in one liter of potassium permanganate. Look at this, liters of potassium permanganate cancel out. If I was to stop right here, I'd have the moles of potassium permanganate, but we have a balanced equation. And we know that for every two, son of a gun. I guarantee you that's all gone. Yep, okay, let's start over. Oh, coronavirus. Four point eight eight times ten to the minus four moles of KMNO four in one liter of KMNO four. There we go. This cancels out. We have our balanced equation, and we know that for every come on, we know that for every two moles of potassium permanganate, we consume five moles of um, calcium oxalate. Here we go. Again, we can see that moles of potassium permanganate cancel out, and we're left over with moles of calcium oxalate. And when we punch all that spinach into our calculator, we end up with 2.50 times 10 to the minus 6 moles of calcium oxalate. Remember, sig figs count. Significant figures count, right? We're given three sig figs here. We're given three sig figs here. Remember, the stoichiometric coefficients, the 2, the 5, the 8, the T, 
10, whatever, those are exact numbers. Those have an infinite number of sig figs. And so our final answer has to have three significant figures. Anyhow, give me a thumbs up if you think you can solve a problem that deals with a redox um, titration. As long as I give you a balanced equation, again, I don't expect you to know how to balance redox uh, titration equations, not in this class. That's a general chemistry two content thing. And so we'll learn that then. Okay, well, let's move on. Here's the solution put forth by Dr. Um, Silverberg. You can see she does the converting the milliliters into liters for you. But again, I rely on my students to use the old brain once in a while to figure out some of those things. All right, well, let's talk about some, some kinds of types of reactions here. I'd say that this is more the, more the qualitative part of redox. Right, we've already looked at quantitative. We've learned how to calculate oxidation number. And now we're going to talk about some, some types of, of reactions um, that involve some, um, some oxidations and reductions. Uh, let's see here. Cha -cha 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 -cha. And not all of I'm just looking at the slide here and thinking to myself, you know, every once in a while, and instructors, just, I'm just like you guys. Is anybody like me? You just look at a subject sometimes. You just kind of zone out on it. Just start thinking, you know. Anyhow, I'm just looking at the slide and thinking, well, not all of these reactions are redox reactions, okay? Some of them are. Some of them aren't. Anyhow, but we'll, we'll get through it. So, again, this is section 4.6. Um, we're going to look at combination, decomposition, deplacement, and uh, combustion reactions. The first one is a combination reaction. This is where we take two or even more reactants and we combine them to um, to make a new compound. So, you know, I'm just trying to think to myself here. What's the what's the easiest way for me to explain this to my students? You know, I think it would be like this. You start with more, okay? You start with more compounds or elements, and you end up with less, okay? That's probably the easiest way to describe. A combination reaction in a decomp reaction or a decomposition reaction is the opposite. You start with, with less, you know, a single compound. So you start with less and you end up with more. Right? You're breaking it apart or you're decomposing it. I find that these two reactions are actually very intuitive for most students. They just hear the word combination and they're thinking, well, I'm going to combine some things together to make a, a single thing or I'm going to go from more to less. A decomposition makes sense. Something's decomposing, so I'm breaking it apart. The displacement reaction, there's a couple types of displacement reactions that we are concerned with in chemistry 1401. We're concerned with um, double displacement reactions. These are not redox reactions. So not, not a redox reaction. Okay, double displacement is not a redox reaction. And in a double displacement reaction, these are usually acid-base reactions or reactions where a precipitate forms. Remember when we looked at the solubility table earlier on in this class? Um, those were usually double displacement reactions. And so we could even write that in here, precipitate being formed or acid-base, okay? Reactions, reactions. Another name for a double displacement reaction is a metathesis reaction, metathesis. Reaction and, and I covered this with you earlier on in the class. Just want to put that bug in your ear. The next one is a single displacement reaction. This is usually where a metal will replace a cation, or uh, and a non-metal replaces an anion. So a single displacement reaction, and then finally a combustion reaction, which is again most certainly a redox reaction, and that's when we combine something with oxygen. Okay. Sometimes you'll hear combination reactions. We could put here sometimes, sometimes, not always, but sometimes called rusting. Okay, so rusting like that. Okay, and so combination, decomposition, displacement, which can be double displacement or a metathesis reaction, single displacement, and then finally combustion reactions. And you, you need to be aware of all these different types of reactions. Where was I? Oh, good gravy. I'm really losing it today, aren't I? Uh, let me see if I can find where I am in my slides. Come on. Da -da -da. Where was I? No. Okay, 
know. It's all the way here. Here we go. Okay. Can you guys still see my screen? I just want to be 100% sure that you can before I begin pontificating to you all. Okay, thanks, Don. Appreciate it. Good. All right. So combining elements to form uh, an ionic compound. You know, something to think about in this type of reaction here where you have elements combining to form an ionic compound, whenever you have a free element, okay? And you can see that you're starting with two free elements. Here's potassium, which is a solid in its natural state, and chlorine, which is a gas in its natural state. Whenever you have a free element in a reaction that's in a compound, you know, either in a composition or a decomposition reaction, if you have free elements, on one side and then comp they're in a compound on the other, that's definitely going to be an oxidation reduction reaction. So that's always going to be a redox equation, okay, or a redox reaction. Now, if we think about the oxidation numbers of potassium and chlorine in their pure form, right? Um, chlorine is just a gas, okay, Cl2. Its oxidation number is zero. Normally, we don't write the zero in, right? We just leave that out. Okay, we don't write chlorine that has a charge of zero. It's got no charge. We just omit it. So we usually just write Cl2. Same thing with potassium. We just write potassium solid. We don't write potassium zero, even though that's what the charge is. So again, since both of these are in their pure form, the potassium has an oxidation number of zero, and the chlorines have oxidation numbers of zero. But when you combine them, you can see that there's a very exothermic reaction. Exothermic. I could use a different color here. Exothermic. Come on. Exothermic. There we go. You can see there's some light and some heat given off there in this exothermic reaction. And then you end up with this. Look at this. There's a white solid in there. And that's an ionic compound. And that's potassium chloride. So what's happening here is you're forming potassium chloride solid, an ionic compound. What's potassium chloride made of? It's made of potassium, which is in group 1A. What did we know about the oxidation number of any element that's in group 1A? They all have oxidation numbers of plus one, and we didn't have any exceptions for that. What about chlorine? Chlorine is in group 7A. Um, it's not combined with another halogen, so chlorine is going to have an oxidation number of plus one. So overall, the Potassium goes from an oxidation number of zero to plus one. So it is undergoing oxidation. My chlorine, on the other hand, is going from an oxidation number of zero to minus one. And so it is undergoing reduction like that. All right. Excuse me just a second. It would also be wise to note that free metals are always oxidized and will always be a reducing agent. Free metals are always oxidized and will be a reducing agent. What do you mean by this reducing agent, Mr. Dion? Well, Let's take a look. If the potassium is undergoing oxidation, that means it's causing the chlorine to be reduced, right? It's giving electrons up, so it's causing that chlorine to be reduced. The nonmetal, the chlorine, is undergoing reduction, but it is the oxidizing agent, right? It's causing oxidation, okay? And so again, the potassium is the reducing, reducing agent, it's not being reduced, it's being oxidized, but it's the reducing agent. And the chlorine is undergoing reduction, but it is the oxidizing, oxidizing agent. Okay, give me a thumbs up if you follow me on oxidation, reduction, and then 
oxidizing agent and, reduc and uh, reducing agent. I know I'm, I might be going a little slowly for some of you, but hey, you know, I just want to take my time and make sure that everybody follows me before we start blasting ahead, you know. All right, great. Thanks, Kira. Thanks, Joel. I appreciate the feedback. If you have any questions, of course, stop me. That's why they pay me $350 an hour. Okay. Uh, son of a gun. Mr. Dion's really striking out here with the with the uh, iPad here today, isn't he? Okay, where was I? Go back <laughs> again and again. Okay, now that all my um, now that all my writing has been deleted on the last one. Anyhow, um, what's next? Here's a decomposition reaction, right? We just looked at a combination reaction. Okay, now we're going to look at a decomposition reaction. This is mercuric oxide or mercury two oxide. It's an ionic compound. We have mercury, which is a metal, combined with oxygen, which is a non-metal, and when we have a decomposition reaction involving mercury two oxide forming mercury and oxygen, well, who's being oxidized and who's being reduced? Let's look at that first. Look, the mercury is going from plus two to zero. That means it's gaining electrons, right? M plus two plus a negative two. So you have to add negative. Electrons are negative. So it is undergoing reduction, right? It is being reduced, okay? What about the oxygen? It's going from minus two to zero. That means it's losing oxygen, right? Oxidation is losing, reduction is gaining. So that means that the oxygen is being oxidized in the process. Now, when you have an ionic compound and both of the elements are obviously not free, this agent, the mercury, the mercury two oxide or the mercuric oxide, as I like to call it, this is both the oxidizing and the reducing agent. Okay, so let's write that in here. It's both an oxidizing and a reducing agent. Okay, so mercuric two oxide is the oxidizing agent and it's the reducing agent in this pro in this specific um, process, this decomposition reaction. All right. So again, so far we've covered a specific example of a combination reaction. We've covered a decomposition reaction. Let's look at a displacement reaction. And we're going to start with um, this displacement reaction where lithium is displacing hydrogen from water. Metals always displace the positive part of a molecule. Um, anyhow, what's going on here? If you take lithium metal, and that's what this is right here. This is a little piece of lithium metal. Looks like somebody's got it in a pair of forceps, which is just a tatsy word for saying tweezers. But you take that lithium metal, which is a solid, okay, has an oxidation number of zero, has no charge, and you put it in some water, okay? what's going to happen is that metal is going to be oxidized, right? It's going to want to get oxidized in this single displacement reaction. Okay, so this is an example of a single, single displacement reaction. Now, the water, which is H2O, which is shown down here, you can think of this as kind of being like, Um, like this, okay? And since we have two of them, you know, it might help you to think of it that way and that the oxygen is displacing two hydrogens like that. I don't know if that helps, uh, but it's not, you know, necessary to think of it that way, okay? Because in water, okay, um, we have H2O. The oxidation number of the oxygen is going to be minus two, and the oxidation number of the hydrogen is going to be, <laughs> it's going to be, come on, plus one. So let's look at what's happening. When lithium combines with water, we end up forming lithium hydroxide. And what else did we form? We formed a gas, right? All these bubbles, which is H2 gas. Okay. What's the oxidation number of hydrogen in H2 gas? It's zero because H2 is the elemental form of hydrogen. That's how it's found in its naturally occurring state. 
Okay, so what's happening overall is that the lithium is going from an oxidation number of zero to an oxidation number of plus one. So it's losing electrons, right? Oxidation is losing. So it is being oxidized. And the metal is a reducing agent, right? Let's write that down here. It is a reducing agent. And as I told you last slide, metals are always going to be oxidized. Free metals will be always be oxidized and they will always be reducing agents. So who's being reduced? Well, if you look at the hydrogen and water, it's going from an oxidation number of plus one to zero. Now, not all of the hydrogens are being um, reduced, but some of them are, two of them are in this balanced equation. And then two of them, the oxidation number does not change whatsoever. And in fact, the oxidation number of the oxygen doesn't change at all. But we still have an oxidation occurring. The free metal, lithium, gets oxidized. And we have a reduction of two of the hydrogen, um, two of the protons or the hydrogen one plus ions becoming hydrogen gas. Okay. Um, you know, I just looking at my notes here and just thinking, and what I wrote here is that you're not going to necessarily be asked to predict these types of reactions, but you could be asked if they make sense, you know, if there's a rationale here. So, I might not give you a question on the next exam where it says, you know, lithium plus water is going to give you what, even though we did look at this reaction earlier on in the class, um, I would, could still give you the reaction and say, you know, what's being oxidized, what's being reduced, and does this make some, <clears throat> excuse me, some kind of sense to you. It's, uh, it's 1031. Let's look at another example. And this is the displacement of hydrogen from nickel. And the way that you would do this is by combining nickel with, with um, HCl, okay? So you would take a piece of nickel and you would actually drop it into hydrochloric acid. So it would look like this. You take nickel, that's a solid. That's not, be bad. not a good spot to write this, is there? If I take nickel, that's a solid, and I combine it with um, HCl, aqueous HCl, I end up with nickel two chloride um, plus H2 gas. Now, you notice that the equation that's written here, okay, this is a net ionic equation, okay, because Cl minus is a spectator ion, spectator ion. Now, what's going on in this reaction? Nickel, in its pure form, has an oxidation number of zero, okay, and it is being oxidized, right? I said that free metals are always going to be oxidized, and they are reducing agents. So it's reducing the hydrogen, which has a charge of plus one in the HCl. Again, the chloride is left out in this equation here, which is shown in the book, okay? So it is undergoing reduction. The hydrogen is undergoing reduction to hydrogen gas, which has an oxidation number of zero. And so the nickel is being oxidized. It is the reducing agent, reducing agent. And the HCl is the oxidizing agent like that. You can see that you form those bubbles of hydrogen gas. And again, chloride is the spectator ion. Let's look at another example. And this is um, copper metal being displaced by silver ions to form silver. And this is a beautiful reaction. It's a spontaneous reaction. If you take copper wire and you put it in a solution of silver ions, so silver always has an oxidation number of plus one. Remember, it's one of the exceptions in the transition metals that silver can only have one oxidation number, which is always plus one. Um, the other two uh, um, exceptions are cadmium and zinc. Anyhow. So you take a piece of copper wire, and that's what this, you know, curled up wire is here. You put it in a solution of silver ions. Here they're putting it in silver nitrate. And you see the silver form crystals or needles of pure silver on top of the copper. And that's what this kind of fuzz is in the second, you know, in the second part of the slide. You see this kind of, some kind of fuzz here. Well, that's actually beautiful silver just um, precipitating on top of the, the copper wire. Also, you'll notice that the solution 
around that copper wire goes from being clear and colorless to being clear, but it has a blue color. And the reason why is because copper two plus ions are actually blue. So you could put that in here. Maybe I'll even write it in the color blue. So Cu two plus is blue, actually. And copper one plus is red, anyhow. Yeah, it is very pretty, isn't it? It's a really neat reaction. It's also an inexpensive reaction. Has anybody ever done this reaction? I remember I did this reaction in high school. You know, I was 16, probably didn't appreciate it all that much. Anyhow, um, yeah, so it is a very beautiful reaction, but I want to walk you through what the heck is going on here a little closer in terms of oxidation and reduction, okay? Look, we have our copper wire, okay? So this is just nothing more than a piece of solid copper. Solid copper is an oxidation number of zero, right? Because it's a pure metal. The silver and silver nitrate, if we analyze AgNO3, what's the oxidation number of silver? Well, we know that nitrate always has a charge of minus one. So that means the silver must have a charge of plus one, right? That's the oxidation number there. In nitrate, oxygen is going to have an oxidation number of minus two times three, which equals minus six. Overall, nit nitrate has a, uh, has a charge of minus one. Therefore, the nitrogen must have a charge of, or an oxidation number of plus five. So nitrogen is plus five, silver is plus one, and oxygen is minus two. So we've got all of those figured out, and those are all shown right here. Now, what's happening is the copper ions actually get displaced by the silver. Look at this, isn't this crazy? Look at this, the silver actually goes and it actually gains electrons. And you can see that I have two silver ions that are reduced for every one piece of copper metal or, co or a copper metal atom that gets oxidized. So again, the silver is being reduced, right? It's undergoing reduction from plus one to zero, and the copper is undergoing oxidation, okay? From copper zero, the metal, right? This is the metal copper, to copper plus two. So it is being oxidized. So that means that the silver nitrate is the oxidizing agent, and the copper is the reducing agent. And we end up precipitating or forming that, that um, silver on top of the copper. And again, that's what all these, you see it's little needles, and it might be hard to see depending on the size and the resolution of your screen, but that is what's going on in that um, in that picture. Kind of pretty.